We've been talking a lot about Angmar lately, and so Arnor has come up quite a few times. It's impossible to separate the two, as the war with Angmar was the ultimate doom of Arnor, and yet the conflict with them was what unified the southern kingdoms of men and elves to come up and drive them out, setting the stage for the conflict to come. So it was inevitable that I would one day raise an army of men to stand against my horrific horde of filthy weirdos. And that day is today. However, there's a lot to Arnor that really doesn't get brought up all that much, particularly if you only go by Games Workshop's telling. While we have talked about Rudor a couple of times now, they are only one part of the tragic tale. And to appropriately bring these people to life on the tabletop, we have to go deeper. So here is a quick summary of the history of Arnor, leading to the inevitable conflict with Angmar and the end of their great kingdom. The creation of Arnor begins with the destruction of Numenor, the mythical land of men, which sank into the sea. King Elendil and his sons were among those who survived, and in their plight they sailed to the banks of Middle-earth and established their kingdoms. While at Sildor and Inarion established the kingdom of Gondor in the south, Elendil went north and built the great kingdom of Arnor, in which he ruled over all others as the High King. Despite his grand history, Arnor was never as great as Gondor, as both Elendil and his sons were killed in the war with Sauron, and while the enemy was ultimately defeated, Arnor never recovered from the loss. Over generations of decline, the kingdom was eventually torn apart due to the infighting of three brothers who, upon the death of their father the king, split the kingdom into three independent lands, Arnor, Cardolan, and Rudor, in a civil war that would ultimately doom the land. And this was the state of Arnor when the darkness of Angmar took hold, and so portraying them as one unified group simply wouldn't work as hundreds of years passed between the start of the war and the splitting of the land. There are so many questions that this leaves us with. What led to the splitting of the brothers? How did the kingdoms develop over time? And how were they affected by the outside world? And the idea of a grand unified army with different heraldry and styles was just too much fun not to do. And so today I'll be taking you through the fluff that I have developed for these three different kingdoms, as well as how these impacted the builds and colors for the Arnor army I was ultimately working on. So to start stuff off, let's look at Arthedain. Arthedain is the greatest of the three lesser kingdoms, as it was established by the eldest son of the late king, and so retained the bulk of the power and industry. However, they are incredibly traditional, feeling that they need to maintain the status quo and keep moving forward, despite the clear failings of their kingdom's rule, which had been slowly destroying it over time. To represent this, I want them to be well-equipped, but a bit standard and regimented. So I turned to historicals. I ended up being really drawn to the late Roman look. And so when Wargames Atlantic released a new plastic kit of them, I jumped at the opportunity. This kit is fantastic, with lots of options and beautiful crisp sculpts, or at least till you get to the head. There's a lot of variety here, but none of them are very good, and they're easily the weakest part of the kit. But I did really like the style of the late Roman helmets, and so turned to another manufacturer, Gripping Beast, as they had tons of extra heads as well in their late Roman set, which looked so much better and easily fit onto the Atlantic bodies. I built all of these pretty standardly from the kit, with very little changes, as the late Roman look is quite generic Dark Age historical, though I did mix in some of the armored bodies from the Gripping Beast set for variety. For their armaments, I was sure to equip everyone with spear and shield as per their profiles, as well as a banner bearer and two captains with sword and shield. I also pushed a bit of individuality by adding feathers to a few of the models as a way of breaking them up, and as a potential designation of great families, perhaps with ties to the dwindling Dunedain. I also added some small cloaks or shrouds to some of them to just give them a bit more personality. As for the shields, this is where I really wanted to set them apart from their historical roots, and decided to go for the tower shields from the film version of the Gondor Warriors, as I felt this would tie them to the Middle-earth world, and also bring them more into the fantasy realm. However, this meant I needed to steal a lot of shields, and using the ones from the GW sets just wasn't economical. Enter Medbury Miniatures. Andrew is a spectacular artist, and a patron of the group, who has created a fantastic line of both fantasy and historical 3D printed models. 
I particularly love the historicals like the spearmen here as they're just so natural looking. And some of these guys are definitely going to be making their way into the army as heroes. And so I am supporting him on Patreon and he was also kind enough to send me over files for some blank shields he did that fit the look I was going for perfectly. And when my patron John reached out to tell me he got a 3D printer, it all just fell into place. And so I gave most of my soldiers these beautiful shields while mixing in a few round ones as a kind of precursor to Boromir's in the films. These make for a great unified look across the whole army and the perfect canvas for some freehand heraldry. So on that note, let's get to painting. As I said, I wanted to keep these guys fairly drab and uniform, and so went with the classic black look, which was heavily influenced by this image from the old GW sourcebook. Though honestly, little of this showed up due to the heavy use of chainmail, but it was there on the shields. I tried to paint these up in a fairly organic way with quite stark contrast through the use of a universal colored highlight which I mixed into all of the base coats, as well as a lot of wet blending as that's just my favorite thing to do right now. As for the heraldry, I decided to go with the Star of Elendil, as I felt this was the perfect sigil for Arthur Dane. They were traditionalists that honored their roots, and who believed they were the true rulers of the realm. So the use of Elendil's history as a guiding force moving forward was perfect. As for the bases, I decided to go for a bit of a Scottish Highlands vibe, as they are from the north, but not far enough that I wanted snow. So I stuck to very dark and earthy bases with lots of big rough rocks before decorating them with lots of tufts. In particular, I made myself sing purple flowers to represent heather by gluing some purple flock onto some green tufts I had around. This was a recommendation from another one of my patrons, John, and I love how it turned out. And with them all set and looking lovely, let's move on to the second kingdom, Cardolan. There is honestly not much about Cardolan in Tolkien's writing, and basically all we know about them is that they occupied the most southern reaches of the land, which included the Barrow Downs, the ancient tombs for the kings of old. With my development of Arthur Dane, their relationship to the past was a big element, and so I decided to take this as a running theme across the kingdoms. And so Cardolan is also steeped in their reverence of the past, but rather than moving on, they feel that their time has come to an end. I like to think they took some influence from the elves here in their feelings of diminishment, but that rather than being sad, they were joyous. Honoring the greatness of old through celebration and a return to a more simple and natural life. Honoring the land. And so I wanted to lean away from the ready for battle look, opting for a unarmored style to show their reluctance to engage in conflicts. I mainly use the unarmored bodies from the Gripping Beast kit, as well as the heads with caps from both this set and the War Games Atlantics one. And I even incorporated some of the head wraps from the War Games Atlantic Persian Warriors kit, which I also picked up for this project. Finally, they once again got feathers and a variety of shields before moving on to painting. For the painting, I wanted to do something very different that would convey the more light-hearted nature of these people, and ended up going with a mix of greens and yellows, and immediately regretted it as they were hard to paint. Rather than requiring several more layers, I painted these up in much the same way as my Arthedanians, flipping the colors between the models for variation. This also worked out as a kind of tie to the GW look that used greens as a primary color for Arnor overall. Then for the heraldry, I was a little stuck for a while, considering at first the crown of Gondor, but that wouldn't work because there wasn't a crown of Arnor. A crown was created later, but only in Gondor, and originally it's just Isildur's helmet, which was recovered after he was killed. However, I did already establish a bit of an elven influence for these guys, and so the idea of incorporating the imagery of the Ring of Barahir jumped into my mind. This ring was given as a gift from the elves long ago and was made up of two snakes and a crown of golden flowers, which both seemed to beautifully fit the nature theme I was going for. And so I did a mix of these on a figure. Simple crowns for some, snakes for others, and both on the banner. Finally, these guys are based up like before, and we're moving on again. Which brings us to Rudor, and we've been here before.
I've talked about these guys a couple of times now in previous videos, so basically, these are the bad guys who sided with Angmar in the war. But why are they evil? Well, if you just look at the books, we really don't know. There's a vague implication in the text that it was due to the dying off of the Dunedines of the region, as well as the mingling with the local hill tribes. However, I don't think I really want to make the source of evil here impure bloodlines, as that has some nasty undertones. Instead, I decided to once again explore their relationship to their past. And while Cardalan is joyous and celebratory, Brudor is vengeful and bitter. They saw the slow decline of their kingdom being directly caused by others, such as the Elves and Men of the South, and blamed them for what they felt had been done to them. As such, they are far more aggressive and warlike than the other kingdoms, with a wilder and more extreme nature to them to tie into that hill tribe style. I also like to imagine they had little industry and production of their own, and so their equipment might be older and more mismatched, giving new recruits any spear and shields they had lying around and getting to it. So I went hard with the kit bashes here and decided to break out several boxes, starting with a mix of both the kits from the other two builds to represent turncoats from their kingdoms who were enticed by Rudor's rhetoric. But from there we just kept going, using a lot of the bodies and bits from the Persian kit, as well as other bits from just about anything else I had lying around. We had some Hail Caesar Celts, Oathmark Goblins, Perry Miniatures, Frostgrave Soldiers, and just about anything else I could find. In particular, I got to use the fantastic bear hats from the War Games Atlantic Roman kit for the captains. I just love these. From there, the painting went in a similar manner, but I stuck to more muted and simple colors to convey a less regimented look. Like they were wearing whatever they came with. To get them to look a bit brungier too, I also added a fair bit more washes here as well. Finally, for the heraldry, I liked the idea of them claiming the shards of Narsal as their rallying point, and a symbol of their broken kingdom and the wrongs the outside world has done to them. So I incorporated this onto their banner and shields, mixing the colors up between red, white, and black. I also included more mismatching shields here, but still tried to unify them by bringing in the colors and stippling them on in patterns, as if they had been roughly painted on. And with that, our last little hateful group is done, and we have the startings of a real army here. I know I say this a lot, but I love how these turned out. The three different groups are just so unique, and I feel like they all have very distinct yet consistent personalities. I also love how we were able to draw these influences through exploring and inventing the lore and history of their world. It just goes to show just how important that can be. But this is only the start. While there aren't many units in the list, I still have a lot of infantry to paint, and will eventually need to convert up some kings and a cheeky seeing boy to go along with them. I started this expansion by prepping some metal models from footsore miniatures to eventually become rangers who I'll paint up as a kind of unaffiliated woodsman with no particular loyalty, but for Arnor and its lands. As well as what I like to think of as a kind of royal guard, a profile which I came across while looking through the old War of the Ring book. This guy definitely looks a bit weird, but I like to think of him as looking a bit more Numenorian as a nod to their history, and so tried to integrate the taller helmets that Tolkien described, as well as a more Grecian slash early Roman look, as those are the kind of vibes I'm feeling lately. And so while this won't be as overarching a project as our work up in Angmar, there's definitely going to be more about these guys, though maybe this time I won't try to convert 50 models at once, as I need to slow down a bit there. But thank you all for watching, and particular thanks goes out to Bartoz and Toma, my new Tuist supporters on Patreon. I cannot say enough how much your support means to me, and it's and it's really just incredible to see. And if you like what we do here and want to get involved and support the show, 
hop over to the page to check it out. But for now, just thank you all for watching, as that's still the best thing you could possibly do. But be sure to subscribe if you haven't, click the bell, like, comment, share it around, and all that good stuff. And most importantly, stay safe everyone, and Happy New Year.